Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season we're a little bit different. How do you, as a recruitment leader and founder, maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm gonna be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm gonna to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the RAG Podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media. Um, I'm delighted to be back today. Um, I'm not on my own. I've just changed the format slightly so that I bring the guest in um, shortly. Um, today, I'm joined by Ishpal Bansal. Um, Ishpal is the founder and CEO of Aston Homes, a resourcing and talent acquisition consultancy founded back in 2014. Um, alongside his partner, Brad, they've grown a business now of over 50 people across London, Cape Town and Johannesburg. So the UK and African um, locations, very, very similar to what we're doing here at Hoxo at the moment. Um, interestingly, Ishbal started his career in law and then moved into recruitment and RPO, which then led him to founding his business. I've been talking to Ishbal a lot recently. We've, we've connected on many different levels and he's someone I, I like, I trust, and I believe that um, we'll be very honest and add a lot of value to, uh, you know, to people thinking about growing their recruitment business, reaching the sort of 50 plus staff, um, and the trials and tribulations along the way. So let's get into today's show. We're going to welcome Ishbal to the session. Ishbal, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks, Sean. Uh, appreciate you having me on board. Um, great to be here. Thanks Not for the invite. Look, I'm super excited to have you on. You also wore the black t-shirt. Not that I, I, I planned it. Yeah, that. no, we didn't get, I didn't get the memo, but uh, yeah. great minds, they say, right? Hold it out. Well, look, mate, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get... You know, I tried to give you an introduction, but be honest, just do me a favor. Tell, give us that overarching view of who you are and what you do for the listeners. Um, okay, so who am I? I'm, I guess I'm just like uh, any of the other guys out there. Uh, you know, um, born and brought up in Kenya, kind of went through the education system there, came here, studied law. It's it typically a, a thing you do, you know, from an Asian family. You, you kind of either go down the doctor, lawyer, pharmacist type route. Right. Um, but, but law was something that I, um, I loved studying, to be honest, but it's not something that I really wanted to do. Um, and at, uh, I was at this graduation drink and I met someone from a company called Finance Professionals. Uh, and they, they, are, they just asked me a simple question. They're like, what do you want to do in the future? And I was like, well, you know, I want to work with people, maybe start a business. I, I don't know, you know, do, do something. I come from a, a family of, um, you know, my grandfather and father were, were, were really great guys and started their own businesses, you know, were real pioneers of their time. So I was like, you know, maybe I'll do something like that in the future. He's like, well, why are you doing law? And um, cut a long story short, invited me in for a couple of interviews and um, into recruitment. And he told me about how recruitment was this... Um, amazing career it's one of the hardest sells you'll ever have in your life because you're not only you're not just selling a product to a to a uh, to a company to, to a person you're actually finding careers for people you're finding pe uh, companies their best assets and it's a two-way seller because it's one of the most difficult sells um but you know when i first joined i was like okay the sell is hard but you know i needed to connect with the industry and it wasn't until probably month eight or nine sean if i'm honest that i really connected with this industry and I really realized, I was like, well, actually, you know, we get to advise on one of the top three or four decisions of anyone's life. It's either typically getting married, uh, buying a house, you know, starting a family or their career. And, you know, if we do it in a good, responsible way, actually, the, the career suddenly had a lot of meaning for me. Um, and, and not to mention, obviously, finding the most important asset of, of companies. You know, you look at all these great products out there, but it's actually made by people. So, yeah, that's how I came into recruitment. No. And 
to now tell us, like, Aston Homes, 50 people that I've yes. mentioned, you got the South African UK. Like, who do you, what type of companies do you work with? How is it split? Okay, so Aston Homes is, um, so as you said, it's an integrated, embedded uh, talent solutions business. Uh, I used to work for Alexander Man Solutions, one of the, the large RPOs. Um, yeah. we, we, we saw a gap in the market and we felt that we could provide more nimble, modulated solutions to, to clients. Um, so we started off with this vision that we would work across the UK, Middle East and Africa. We saw great potential in Africa and I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. Yeah. Um, and the kind of clients we went for, if I'm honest, Sean, in the beginning was, you know, just any client that we could secure. You know, <laughs> we bootstrapped this business from day one. You know, there, there wasn't a coherent client strategy, if, if I'm brutally honest, there was, you know, where can we add value? Can we deliver? And if we could, whether it was a large enterprise client or a small, medium sized enterprise, it didn't matter. You know, it's whether we could deliver to them and, you know, deliver well, that's what mattered. So we ended up getting quite a few enterprise clients, you know, the likes of, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, Burberry, uh, just to name a couple of big, big brands out there. Um, we did short term projects. Um, but today, our portfolio is quite broad. Um, we're heavily into high growth businesses, especially high growth tech businesses. That tends to be a core part of what we do, um, as well as enterprise solutions and, you know, providing either a fully integrated talent solution where we're fully embedded in and we run the full um, talent acquisition function or we bolt on and become part of the internal talent acquisition function of the client. Wow. So you you you've gone from what i believe traditional recruitment into rpo and then you've spotted an opportunity to form your own version and and you know work with all different types of clients we've got people saying they're watching from both africa and wales right now which is interesting so we've got people watching oh, wow. um which is great in terms of so how long did you do the did you do classic contingent you know standard recruitment agency recruitment that's not rpo for a how long were you doing that for? I did that from 2000 to 2005. So I did it with finance professionals, went into Martin and Anderson. And then that's when I got approached by Alexander Mann Solutions. Um, and I initially went into uh, work for a guy called Tom Marsden, who was uh, running the Deloitte account. It was a new solution for AMS, uh, as they're known now. And um, yes, yeah, so I went in as kind of a mid manager, senior manager. And then, uh, but, but there was a, a path from, you know, for me to become the kind of head of the account very quickly, which is something Tom, uh, Tom and I spoke of when we interviewed, and and that did come to fruition to to the credit of uh, of the business. And so I was there for a good nine years, and we, you know, we took the Deloitte solution from I think it was about ten or twelve people to 100 and, uh, 120, 130 people across a few geographies, um, and we we were doing all permanent hiring, uh, employer branded solutions, contingent hiring, graduate hiring. Uh, for Deloitte, and um, it was a great, uh, great uh, period in my career. Learned a lot from uh, AMS as a business. Um, got to work uh, very closely with the, the founder, um, especially um, towards the latter part of my career with them. It was great to kind of get involved in how the business was then, you know, kind of geared up for new investment but through private equity. Um, so I had the good fortune of kind of working on. Um, uh, on those pitches and stuff and that was that was really good fun and and i think that that in a way also shaped my thinking sean around well actually you know i've, I've had a really great career with um, rpo you know worked with a great business like um, ams there's some phenomenal people i worked with learned a lot deloitte as a client was phenomenal to start off with i ended up having a portfolio um but there was something missing and i i just thought you know uh you know, I was born and brought up in Kenya, and I thought, look, you know, there's something to be done in Africa. And uh, I had um, a few directors who worked for me, and one of them, Brad, who's my co-founder, um, he was from South Africa, and he always used to say to me, he's like, you know, I think I'm going to go back to, you know, South Africa, and um, we should do something. And we both wanted to give back to Africa because we both have products of Africa, and you know, I think Africa, Africa is a phenomenal place. You know, whoever, if anyone hasn't been there. I, I could not encourage you more to go there. I think the me I'm going, I'm going hopefully in about March next year for the first time. We've got like well, you've got a team there, right? So percent of the business pretty much forty percent is in South Africa, and and we've never I've never been, so I can't wait. We've got people in Joburg and Cape Town and Port Elizabeth and I think Durban a couple. So there's a bit of a we're going to meet everyone in Cape Town. I think but I can't wait. 
Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I sometimes think the uh, the media doesn't do it justice, but it's a phenomenal place. So we, we, we kind of grew up in that system. We got educated in that system. And we just thought this phenomenal talent out there. And we thought it's a kind of missed opportunity because most of the big kind of shared service centers were being put in Manila, India, you know, uh, Poland in Krakow and so on. And we just said, look, we want to go back to Africa. We think there's phenomenal talent there. It's got a really young population. And we were like, well, let's bring that talent to the world, you know, and um, and that was why we 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 launched in Africa. We launched in South Africa it's because we both were passionate about Africa. Um, Brad won the the home country toss because uh, you know Kenya wasn't quite large enough at the time as a market for us to go into. Um, but that's how we ended up in. And you both you were both living in London and working together in London at the time. Yeah, so Brad and I have worked together for about 15, 16 years. So he. Hmm. He was um, he was one of the guys who um, he was one of the researchers at finance professionals, and I was one of the consultants, and we kind of hit it off there. Uh, and we've got quite an interesting journey ourselves because um, uh, you know he worked as a researcher, uh, and and you know we worked well together. He then became my client when he went and set up an in-house function with the Carlton Warehouse, um, and then. We circled back, and he came onto the Deloitte account as one of my one of my managers, and um, it's been phenomenal. A great journey with him. He's a super terrific guy, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a shame he couldn't be on today. He's actually in Berlin with one of our clients um, at, at one of their leadership offsites. So, uh, but he's he's a great guy, one of the best client focused people I know. And um, take, us back, take us back to when you started the business. Like, what was that? Can you remember the moment you decided this is it? We're doing it. Like, can you remember where you were, what you were doing? Yeah, I do. So, um, so, so the build-up to me making the decision had been going on for a while, and a lot of my team had been, especially my directors, had been saying, "Well, Ish, you know, why don't you go and set something up yourself?" And Brad and I had spoken loosely, and he talked about going back to Africa, and he's like, "Look, if you want to do something, ever on your own, you know, I'm, I'm here." Um, but I was also really bought into AMS, and um, you know, I was, um, I was, I was quite enjoying my career there. But uh, at the time, we, um, so Rosie and I had spoken about this African idea and um, she, 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 she really bought into it and she backed it and she said, look, you know, we could probably do this within AMS. Um, our eventual buyers were New Mountain Capital and, you know, they just saw a much bigger opportunity in the US. And so I had been sent over to the US just to look at it and see whether I'd, I'd go out there and, and, you know, play a role there. And it was on the flight back. I remember this very clearly. It was on the flight back. I had been to the US, I'd had a, an amazing few days there with the team in New York. I'd met uh, a couple of the clients. I'd even gone out and seen potential properties to live in and stuff. And I just thought, you know, if I stay here, I'm going to be here for, for, for a long time. And this dream or this vision or this opportunity to do something in Africa is not, not going to materialize. Um, and I was, what, I was approaching 38 at the time. So I was like, you know, I've got some energy now. Now's the time to do it. So it was on that flight back from New York. Sean did, you have, did you have a family and stuff at that point? Was the risk attached to making that move? A massive risk. So um, uh, I became a father at 29. So my daughter was uh, was 10. Um, she was in school. We'd uh, moved home. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of risk attached. I had, I had fortunately saved up a bit of cash. So one of the things... Brad and I did well is and my advice to any entrepreneur is if you want to do this make a plan you know and definitely have a runway of cash for yourself at home especially mm. if you're bootstrapping your business and on raising capital definitely have a, a runway of cash at home uh, and for me the one of the most important things that that I would say is find a good co-founder you know I know it's a lot of people kind of go at it alone for me you know Co-founding with Brad was the was the best decision uh, of my life because soon after we founded the business, so we founded the business. Um, soon after we founded the business, probably nine months after we founded the business, when we started opening our African offices, um, I got diagnosed with a, a mitral valve defect. You know, wow. it came completely out of the blue. Um, I had no idea. I was just getting very tired, and um, I went to see a doctor. And you know, again, long story short. The next thing I know, you know, I had to go for open heart surgery and get this valve uh, fixed. So wow. it was a pretty scary time in, uh, in not in, not only in my personal life, but also the fact that we just launched this business. We were less than a year old, and um, 
and you know i was undergoing the surgery and, and the surgery did knock me out sean if i'm honest I, I was out of the business for probably a good okay physically maybe you know eight eight nine weeks but mentally you know good six months i just want to mention our sponsors for today um you know the guys and our friends over at odro um i don't know if you've heard but odro have been publishing a bit of information in the last week or two about this new framework that they're bringing out. This They're calling it the the, the, the framework, right? Um, well, if you don't follow the guys, I, I want to tell you a little bit about it, right? So based on conversations they've had with the best of the best of their recruitment clients, they've pulled together what they call the framework, which is effectively a diagram of all the different touch points and meaningful um, engagements that a recruiter can have with candidates and clients using video. So it's all the times in the recruitment process that you could use their tool or a video tool to improve your opportunity to, to get to be successful. And that in, it involves things like attracting talent, assessing talent and providing aftercare and ultimately improving relationships. Well, it's pretty simple when they've written it down on paper. I've seen this diagram it is insanely you know clear and simple and easy to use. Um, so um, if you're interested in this, hit the guys up for a demo. Um, at odro.co.uk forward slash demo. They'll be happy to send it on, I am sure. Something as serious as heart surgery. I mean, I don't even know. I can't even empathize with that because I've never been through anything as serious as that. But I, I, had, a, I had a blood clot in my back last year in the summer and it was a lump that was really random. I was exercising like mad in the first lockdown and I had... Um, this really hard lump up here at the bottom of my back and everything was done remotely via video. So I'm on the phone to the GP and he's, he's like, can you feel it? And is it hard and all this stuff? And I was like, yeah, it's, he was like, I think it's this. And I was like, everything you're telling me, it doesn't feel like you're saying. And he's like, go yeah. to the, so I got taken to the hospital anyway. They then rushed me through for a scan and he phoned me up and he's like, did the doctor tell you what it was? And I was like, no. And he's like, we think it, it's either a blood clot or it's, it's a, it's a cancerous tumor. It's a sarcoma. And I was right. like, Scary wow. stuff. Yeah, and that was like June, May, June 2020. Yeah. And I've just launched my academy. My business is flying. I'm at home. Yeah. I was actually splitting up with my wife at the time, which people didn't know about. And then this happened. And I was like, well, six, six weeks of it. And yeah, and then it, it went away. And it was, it was a blood clot. But I can only empathize to that, that my brain was an absolute mess. And I was trying to jump on Zoom and webinars and podcasts and help my team but really I wasn't there so yeah. you know your, your brain doesn't I don't think you can handle you can't take on those big moments in life and spread yourself across everything else and be and be present it's very hard no it's, it's really hard and you know um I, I know I, I went through denial first I mean I hid this from my family and Brad for a long time because I wasn't sure so I was going through all these tests and I was like okay so what's the outcome you know am I going to take a couple of pills and am I going to be okay complete denial you yeah. know not thinking that at 38 that I'm going to need open heart surgery, you know, complete denial. Then I went through, you know, a week of, you know, being really down because I was like, wow, you know, what happens, you know, and I had to make a will and, you know, we had to do that kind of stuff. I had to talk to Brad about continuity of the business. I mean, you think worst case scenario, I mean, modern medicine has moved so far forward, you know, with the chances of that happening were slim, but still your mind just plays tricks on you. And then coming out of it, yeah, the post, the post uh, traumatic stress post that is 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 quite challenging, and and so I, I think as a business, even though we found we launched we 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 founded the company in 2014, we didn't really get going. I think until 2017, 20 late 2016, 2017, because 2015 was all setting up. Okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? We made a, a ton of mistakes. Um, you know, this thing happened with with my health. Having Brad was a, was you know life saving. You know, it's a God said, you know, having a good business. I know what I, I would probably empathize with, with all the things you'll say right now, but what, if someone sat there going, I want to start my business, what should they be looking for in a business partner, in your opinion? Well, there are probably a few things. I mean, obviously it goes without saying you need someone who's competent at what they do, because I think if you're not competent at what you do, then you're going to clash heads because you're always going to have expectations from each other um, to, to meet that kind of competency. So I think competency is key uh, in, in terms of whatever uh, you, you need, whatever function you need them to fulfill. 
Um, but the, set, the, the, the most important for me is trust, you know, absolute trust in that individual. I mean, when we, uh, this is not good business practice and I don't encourage this, but when we set up the business, we didn't even write half the stuff down, you know, um, we've got it all documented, but, but I trust him, um, you know, uh, as a family and, you know, I hope he, he feels the same way, but um, I have no doubt in my mind that um, you know, I would look after him or his family or he'd look after mine if anything happened. So there's complete and absolute trust in each other. And even in business decisions, we disagree massively um, on you know strategy, on approaches. And you know even some of our team have heard us you know debate stuff in a really healthy way, but it will never take away from the fact that you know we will back each other a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think the right. trust element is 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 oh, totally. I mean, literally, you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, me and Amma met on the first day of university in 2004. Yeah. And then we were just inseparable through uni. And then we became teachers. And then we went traveling. And then we got into recruitment. And then literally, the, if you looked at our CVs and dates, it's insanely similar. We did like identical yeah. courses. But it, it was, it's a joke. Um, but through all those experiences, it's always been about trust. It's always been that. Like, yeah. Um, and we're open if we make mistakes. We're open if we, you know, we, 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 we doesn't mean we don't clash on things, but it's rare that we ever get to a point that it causes any problems. Um, yeah. But based on what you've said, you know, I, I couldn't imagine a business without a partner personally. Yeah. And you say the same, but I do, I've interviewed plenty that have been really successful without it. And I think, yeah. I, always, I always think they must have some, a different level of energy yeah. because they're on their own. <laughs> they I, might I, have a superpower. I mean, look, I, yeah. I would never, I mean, I would never launch a business on my uh, on my own if I'm honest. You know, I'd always do something with with Brad or uh, you know we've got uh, a couple of directors in the business like Tam and so on who you know we would definitely I'd definitely invite my current kind of crop of of uh, you know people to to join in. You know, um, so so no, I'm with you. I yeah. I, I think there's more fun. and there's, it's also more fun. You know, because I, I remember talking to um, one of my uncles. You know, and um, he'd. Um, he made a lot of cash and he'd been really successful in setting up the business and, and, you know, he, he, he's kind of retired. Unfortunately, he's, um, he's a widower and we were just chatting and um, this is uh, probably 20, uh, 2018, 2019, just before the pandemic. And we were having quite a, a massive growth spurt at that time. And um, we'd had a bit of interest from some parties to, you know, either invest in the business and one, one party had, had, had kind of, indicated they'd like to absorb the whole business and so I remember chatting to him and he's like well I hope you're not even thinking about it and I said no I'm not he goes he goes because you know um he goes I, I would trade places with you in a heartbeat and I was like why and he goes because he goes yes you may you might think I've done it I've been successful and stuff but he goes don't forget to enjoy the journey you know the journey is the most important thing in this in this thing it's not about an end goal or an exit or cash that you want to make at the end of it it is about that journey so this is why i think having a business partner and having people that you can really uh, yeah. Yeah, have fun with is is, is crucial you know because you it's a really good point and and i've probably mentioned this a bit this on this season's podcast i've interviewed a few people that have scaled and exited before so uh, Mark Zanowski was a founder of Staff Group and uh, yeah. David, David Spencer Percival was the founder of Spencer Ogden and Huntress Group. And um, they both said the same thing. It's quite an empty feeling that when you when you exit. Like you have moments where you're like, obviously we've made all this money, but yeah. you know, yeah, they, I'd trade, but I'd go back. And they've, and they've both gone back and done it again because they couldn't see what they're going to do. Um, and, and I mean, I have days, I'm going to be honest, where I'm like, oh my God, I'd love to just get rid of this now and just sit there and- Get an exit, know, yeah. Have a, have a break for a bit but at the same time you know i completely empathize that you you know you it's what it's all about the reason was so i'm so dialed in every day on what i'm trying to do it like it's like an electricity that i couldn't if you turned it off i'd be like well what, what's what's going on um and i think we're you know entrepreneurs are usually wired that way for sure yeah and you know what i, I don't blame you for thinking like that sure i mean the fact that we were even entertaining such conversations is because it does get really hard and you know there, there isn't that smooth graph to to kind of growing it's like a, a jagged line but actually when you look at it the trend tends to be if you're doing the right things it tends yeah. to be yeah but it's it's that constant kind of going back and forth which which makes it tough uh you know for, for entrepreneurs but it's um it can be really rewarding if you've got the right people uh you know you have the right focus the right um 
you know, strategy, go to market, and and, and also a bit of luck. I think uh, never hurts. You know. Sure. So when you said you made a lot of mistakes at the beginning, mm. could you reference some of them for us? Yeah, sure. So some of the mistakes we made is we um, so so given we'd come out of um, AMS, you know, which was this behemoth, huge organization, we'd learned a lot, and we were, and, and you know. The fact that I'd worked with the likes of Deloitte, Aviva, or you know, big corporates. Yeah. I think we were too corporate, if I'm honest. We weren't entrepreneurs. We're probably the accidental entrepreneurs, uh, if, if, if I'm honest, because we came into this business and we, we set it up, but we very much set up in the beginning thinking like a corporate and you know, thinking we needed to have all of this, uh, the back office done, all our operational excellence in, in good order, because we were good operators. We, we knew what we were doing. We knew how to deliver. We'd scaled um, you know, teams from 12 to a couple of hundred people. We'd scaled businesses from you know, a million turnover to 17 million. We, we knew what we were doing from an operator perspective, but actually bootstrapping a startup from scratch, we were complete novices yeah, yeah, so yeah. We, we we made a couple we made quite a few mistakes one we put too much time and effort into for example we didn't put enough time and effort into marketing you know mm. we put more time and effort into our back office operations processes stuff like that which which hopefully will serve us well now but but it was one of those things that you probably want to flip in the early days yeah, yeah. um the other thing is we we probably hired the wrong individuals not that there was anything wrong with those individuals they're great people and superb um, individuals and, and phenomenal skill sets, but they, you know, there's a, there's a certain type of individual that works well in a large organization. They need that structure. They need that focus. They need that um, um, surety of what their role is. You know, the path to the next level, and so on and so forth. And I think coming into a startup world, you almost need, um, you know, mini entrepreneurs everywhere, and you need uh, people who are happy to deal in the gray, happy to deal with the flexibility, who can, you know, really morph into different roles. Because I mean, I play every role. You know, I've been the street sweeper, I have packed boxes, you know, set up printers, as well as trying to run the company. You know, having in, you know investor meetings. So it's it's quite a wide spectrum. So I think you need that kind of flexibility. So we made mistakes in hiring. Um, also, our market message was was uh, was too broad. You know, we we were a small startup, and I think we were trying to position ourselves as being able to you know run almost like like the big boys. And um, and I, I think we missed a trick there in the early days. So those are three, I think, three pretty Massive. big mistakes we made. You know, some of them I, I can empathise. Others I think I did. I actually or we did well was very much around. I came from, went from Randstad to a startup. So I then I was like number eight or something in this business that grew to 52 and then I left. So I, I, I remember being in a startup and I, I actually feel comfortable in that environment. I think I'd struggle in a big organization. I'm not sure yeah. if Fox ever got to the point where it was a big company. I, I don't know if I'd be the right person at that point. I don't think I'm, even now in our agency at 35, 36 people, you know, my business partner is better than me operating across the teams and getting things process driven. I'm more ideas and vision and energy and I'm startup guy that can do five things at once. But when it's when it's running in a box, I might be, you know, I'm not sure I'm the best person for that. Um, and so I was marketing and comms from day one and yeah, well, but the back office bit, <laughs> you don't want me anyway. Your no. yeah. um, but luckily the bit about me and Amma. You know, his role is always been more of a, we call it the visionary and the integrator. You know, I have ideas and he makes them happen because without yeah. without me, it could be stale. Without him, it doesn't get done. And it's yeah. like, it's always worked well. Um, but totally get that. You leave AMS and you start, you know, you, you, you're, thinking, you're thinking big. But I think yeah. that, so do you think, again, now that you're approaching 50 people, yeah. which again, compared to AMS isn't big, but it's still a considerably large organization across multiple locations. Do you think your old skill set's going to start kicking in a lot now? You're going to, you know, you, you'll you'll feel more comfortable again at the point of 50, 60, 100, 200 people. Oh, completely. I, I mean, um, so, so one of the things is we spent a good year and a half, I think, shaking off our corporate shackles yeah. and yeah. trying to think more entrepreneurially <laughs> and, and, you know, thinking about simplifying our message, getting out to market, you know, adapting to clients' needs and, and actually listening more and being more specific. And I think... I think hopefully now we've we've had a real sweet spot where we know we deliver a good solution, we deliver real value to our clients, and so on. Where our where our 
our kind of corporate experiences coming in is about how we build and scale the team and the value we're putting back into them. So the training and development that we can put back into them, a lot of that has come through our careers. Um, how we structure accounts for growth has come from our previous careers. How we are structuring the business and how we would like to scale that has come from previous experience. So a lot of that experience, you know, like taking Deloitte from 12 people to 140 people, we've done that. So we now, we now know what we're doing here, although it's slightly different. Um, so a lot of that experience is now really coming into the fold. I love it. I love it. In terms of the embedded talent model, um, you do also have a, a, a more traditional agency in South Africa, don't you? So yeah. give us the overview of why you've got those two entities. What's the what's the theory behind having both? Okay. Uh, so yeah, no, absolutely. So um, so our, our plan was always to start uh, to run an embedded and integrated talent solutions business. Um, you know, Brad and I hadn't been in recruitment or external recruitment for quite a few years. Uh, but when we came to Africa, we came to South Africa in 2015, 2016, um, the markets were still fairly nascent in terms of RPO, and they still are. They're, they're, now, they're now starting to change, Sean, and we're starting to see more sophisticated buyers. You're seeing a lot of tech businesses come out of South Africa that are raising phenomenal amounts at Series A, and they are looking for more solution-driven uh, talent acquisition um, kind of uh, solutions, um, as opposed to just kind of, you know, the traditional recruitment model. But when we were there, one of the things is we were bootstrapping this business. We didn't raise a lot of money um to fund ourselves so one of the things is when we went to the market and we were pitching embedded talent solutions the market wasn't really ready for it and they pushed back and they were like look we just want good recruitment solutions and if you do that well then we'll, we'll see where this goes so we, we we saw we saw an opportunity a we needed to make some money to keep our business going in africa two we saw an opportunity to also improve on the african um, offering in the talent acquisition space because a lot of traditional businesses there we felt had uh, practices that needed evolving and you know so we thought we'd bring we, we'd try and do something different there so that's when we set up this business 60 degrees which is focused on kind of mid-market to a senior uh, talent acquisition primarily in the local market we've done some international work as well nice. um, and and that was launched uh, with a view to a bringing in an income, B, um, you know, trying to change the market locally, and C, the um, kind of spin-off of that was if we then developed a strong enough relationship with a client, we could then pivot them into an embedded talent solution and say, look, we've been with you guys for X amount of years. We've been placing really well. There is a more cost-effective and a better, more value-added solution, and this is it. Um, and that's kind of the strategy we use there. Yeah. Yeah. It it sounds cool. And so how do you manage your time? Like what's your what does a day look like for you now at this point in the in the business? Um so at the moment so at the moment I, I spend most of my time aligned to a client. So I have um so we've signed a couple of uh, new clients uh, uh, this year and one of them is a really hyper growth tech business. And so um as part of that we needed an account director or a Kind of client lead so it, it's a role that i've been recruiting for and we we should hopefully have someone coming in january to take on so in the interim i've been performing kind of a, a lead nice. talent role there. so i haven't you know so getting back on the client side so i've been spending the majority of my time there with the client um but then the rest of my time is split it's it's, it's really varied from day to day but you know helping run our uh, contingent recruitment business looking at all our accounts and how we um uh, Add value to our clients, you know, account reviews. Looking at our future leaders development, so that's a program that I'm I've launched and I'm leading, which is looking at the talent we have in our business and how do we grow the next crop of future leaders? How do we grow the next, you know, managers, senior managers, directors, VPs, and so on? And what do we need to instill into them? So that's something that I'm doing. Um, overall, kind of business strategy, uh, looking at our product offering and how we simplify. We're going through a whole rebrand and marketing and uh, you know we, we've been talking to uh to yourselves and, and 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 you know just looking at how we position ourselves for 2022 yeah. um and then obviously um kind of coming up to the back end of this year there's a there's a whole budgeting piece and so on so i find myself um doing quite a few things at the moment how do you 
Is there, is there any way you can explain how you stay on top of it? Like, what's your kind of method to making it, to keeping yourself on, ta- on task when you're dealing with so many different things? I, I, you know, I, I can empathize again with all those different projects because that's what we do as, as leaders of businesses. How do you stay on top of it? What's your, what's your secret sauce, do you think? <laughs> my secret sauce is knowing my, uh, I think my secret sauce, if I'm honest, is knowing my limitations. Right. right. And um, so I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm capable at, but I also know where my kind of gaps are. And uh, I have an amazing uh, operations executive assistant who is always on top of me. And uh, so I lean on my team quite a lot. And um, so one of the things I do is I um, I train those around me just to, 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 to make sure that I am on track with certain things. Um, the other thing is, you know, you've just got to be focused and organized with your with your diary. So I have this, I have these books that I'm I'm one of the old school guys, you know. I constantly am writing in a pad and you know making notes and following up and you know my diary is is pretty well organized in terms of you know meetings and calls and stuff. Um, I utilize all the technology I can to keep on top of stuff or you know have uh, follow up calls and so on and so forth. Keep keep that going, um, but then I utilize. Um, Kerry a lot. She keeps me on track with things that I forget, and um, you know, Kerry's I, your operations manager, right? Yeah, she's the operations manager, and she she p- performs kind of an executive uh, assistant role for me as well. And so, um, so she keeps me on the straight and narrow. So we've got all these buckets of tasks that are going on. You know, we've got them all loaded on teams and different projects and stuff. And then she'll so you know, in order to make myself uh, not to make myself kind of a single point of failure. Um, you know, I try and make sure that they're empowered to say, okay, Ish, we need to do this, we need to do that. So, yeah, it, it's it's not easy, Sean, but um, you know, I, I utilize technology, I'm pretty organized. I am, um, I am, um, I work long hours. Um, yeah. So, you, know. you ever feel like your head's gonna blow up? That's how I felt the last week. My head's gonna blow up. Like I'm like, I'm very similar to you. You know, my my marketing manager Kirsty is online posting at the moment in the comments. Takes yeah. so much off my plate, and then I've got my new operations manager takes off my plate. We've got a people manager takes stuff off the plate. You know, sales sales business development manager takes stuff off the plate. Brit- they've got I've got an amazing team, but still, yeah, I just feel like I don't know. I I always feel like we're trying to take on too many projects of change at one time, which we always seem to manage to pull off. But I always think, what am I doing? Just sl- why don't I slow down a bit? Why don't I take a bit of a, you know? But it's, it's just not in my nature. I don't think, and and that bit. You talk about that startup, I call it riding a bike while you're building it, right? So, you, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we've been in this phase for five years and it will, I think we'll always be in that phase. I think that's just part of building a business. You, you, if you wait till everything's perfect, you're too slow to get it out. And that's my opinion. But with that comes this nature or this ongoing pressure that things are going to blow up <laughs> one time. Do you ever feel that? Or is it just, am I just a psycho in the background? No, no. <laughs> I was smiling because I'm like kindred spirits, you know. Mm. Uh, we're, we're definitely kindred spirits in that, you know. I mean, mm. I think, you know, I, I, I have my moments, you know. I um, Sometimes I have sleepless nights, you know. I think, you know, especially when there's, um, you know, especially when you're growing at that, at the rate that some of us have been growing recently, you know, it's great. It's been, and it's nice to see, especially when you get into three digit um, growth, you know, it's like a few hundred percent growth and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, that looks good and it's shiny. But actually behind that, what goes on, there's a loads that goes on and, and it does actually start weighing on you, you know, cash flow, um, growth, you know, having responsibility for so many people, making sure the sales pipeline is keeping on coming in, making sure we're adding value to the individuals, making sure we're delivering value to our clients. It's just so many different elements that are happening um, that, yeah, sometimes I do feel like, whoa, this is, um, there's a lot going on here. The second sponsor for today's episode is Vincere.io. Vincere is the, the all-in-one CRM and, and front to back office platform in the in, in the recruitment sector. Um, I mentioned last two weeks ago that they're launched in the US. I believe they've had um, some really, really good interest since, um, since we mentioned it. There's lots of new clients in the US coming on board. Um, just so you know, they are they're, they're taking it seriously now. They've already had US clients, but they've they've got boots on the ground in Atlanta and they're looking for agencies with 20 plus users who want to scale their business with the latest and greatest technology for recruiters out there. Um, now, if you're in the US or the UK, 
and you're interested in 2022 getting a CRM that you can scale infinitely with, you know, the, the big grand growth plans on the right tech, then get in touch. And anyone who listens to the rag gets great discounts. So go to www.vincere.io forward slash rag. I think why it affects me and probably I'd, I'd imagine you'll empathize is, is it's the decision fatigue because we often what we're what we're responsible for is the the sign off right can we should we do it or not and it's all well and good allowing you know you're always delegating and giving people tasks to do but often they still will come back to you for the overarching decision on yes or no i'm trying to get better at saying look whatever you think go for it like i'm but i'm still that's probably my my biggest thing is decision fatigue and you know there's times where in my personal life like i'll be honest with you i've recently moved out I've got council tax stuff going on here. I've not even read it. You know, five days in, I'm like, I can't think about it. <laughs> I will deal with it, by the way, before someone rings me about my council tax problems. Um, there's there's plenty of, I've got stuff in my personal life kicking off all over. And I, I have this methodology where I go, do I need to make the decision today? If it's yeah. critical in the next 24 hours, I'll go for it. If it isn't, I'm pushing it back. And I learned that from Leo, who was on my podcast recently, who's been a mentor of mine. You know, can do you have to make the decision in the next 24 hours? If not, when do you have to make it? And I've, I've got this habit of pushing things back. Yeah. Um, but what happens is, and Kirsty who's listening will definitely empathize. Sometimes your team, you I don't realize that my team do need a decision because it's going to impact something else. But because I'm the CEO, they'll allow me to go, all right, we'll move that back. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm moving something away, but actually I'm causing problems internally because I'm doing that. So I now need them to be strong enough to turn around and say, no, Sean, we need this decision today, even though it might not seem this is the impact. So it's, it's educating people around you to help this consistent decision-making process, which is draining, but great at the same time. It's great. It's, it's, um, it, it reminds me of that, uh, he's in the movie, uh, is it Margin Call? You know, when there's that scene where they're all in that boardroom and, you know, he's, uh, one of the analysts has figured out that... Um, uh, you know, Lehman's is going. To, I think it was based on Lehman's that the bank is going to go under. Its uh, assets were less than its liabilities, and uh, I think you have Jeremy Irons fly in. He's the big chairman, and he walks in, and you know, he, he asks him, "Okay, so what's going on at three in the morning?" And they all start looking at each other, and you know, he's looking at his boss. He's looking at his boss. They're going right up to the CEO, and he goes, "No, no, you speak to me and speak freely." You know. Um, uh, I make the decisions and that's why they pay me the big bucks, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's a line that just makes me always smile. And I just yeah. think decision-making, you know, people think it's it's easy. It's, it's one of the hardest things on the planet because you've got, you know, to make a decision, you've got to assimilate so much information, process it, come out with it, and then try and make a decision. But the one thing I have learned um, is that indecision is worse than making a decision. 100%. And even if you make a, a pretty, you know, even if you make a bad decision, and you know, I think my my team will attest that I've not always made the right decision. But no. I, I think I'm pretty. One thing I'm pretty good at is just making a call and moving yeah. forward. And it's not always the right call, Sean. I mean, I, no. I make the wrong call. Well, Stephen Bartlett, who who's another, you know, amazing podcast host and scaled his agency and founded it, he said that 51% is the number. That you should allow if you can if you're 51 percent sure on something then make the call because you'll yeah. never be 100 but if you're one percent over the 50 then just go with it and and it'll over a career that will set you in good stead and i i really love that that mantra because yeah you do, like, every decision you make impacts people impacts lives impacts companies impacts other people and you you can sit there and you can bury yourself um and i think in the early days of a recruitment business you don't have as many of those decisions. You, you mean you have the decisions to set up and then you have this grace period, don't you? Where it's you and Brad yeah. and a few others. And then when the more clients come in and the more people, the success creates this layer of stress and decision-making that perhaps like for me, I, I, I ran a team, but I wasn't, I wasn't a manager in the sense that I managed the PL to a certain level. And, and I didn't get that much pressure. They just allowed me to go out and inspire people and grow. I learned, you know, quite quickly about a year or two into Hoxo that there was a lot of shit I wasn't aware of and it was it was tricky um so there's that you know where we are now as business but you know yours is bigger than mine but in a similar sort of time frame you know we've got we, we've got more and more and more and the bigger we get the more clients we get the more team members we get the more decisions and challenges you're going to face yeah no I I I, I completely hear you it, it, it's getting more challenging you know whether it's um you know, how we move people 
through the business, whether it's what clients we take on, whether it's whether we take on new projects, increase our office space, hybrid model, non-hybrid model. You know, there's so many different, and these are big decisions that are that affect uh, you know people's lives. Like I remember back in the the, the early days, um, it was it was quite simple decisions. Like even even the the decision to call ourselves Aston Homes, right? Uh, I don't know if I've if I shared, I think yeah, I shared. That was a story. So, so Brad and I were, um, you know, we were like, we wanted a, a name that was, uh, that would resonate with us, that was personal to us, because we always thought Alexander Mann Solutions, you know, we come from there was a nice, strong Anglo-Saxon name, but it meant nothing, you know, asked anyone in the business, no one knew what it was. Um, so I'm not surprised they dropped it to AMS. So we wanted something that was personal to us, but something that resonated quality. So Aston Martin was uh, my favorite car. It happened to be Brad's favorite car. So we said, okay, Aston is the first part of it. And a strong, we were, start as well. a strong start strong start so we had a good and you know great british brand they were all about quality so that became the qualitative part of yeah. our, our 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 name and then we were sat at the sherlock holmes hotel having our first board meeting uh you know he and he and i and you know setting up the strategy for the business and we said uh, holmes you know because sherlock holmes another great british icon a uh, detective who always solved these cases, like we would always solve our clients' uh, solutions yeah. or challenges and come up with solutions. And um, Aston Holmes was born, but it was a decision that we made on the spot. Yeah. Did not look back and just went forward, you know? Really simple, really straightforward, and we move forward. And we've made quite a few decisions like that really quickly, but there are some other ones that, as you said, they make your head want to explode. Um, I find I have to revert to meditation, you know, um, hitting, uh, you know, going to the gym, walking, uh, anything to kind of just, you know, release the, the pressure cooker. That's a, that is a question I wanted to get onto. Like you as a, as a human, so you, yeah. you are the founder, you're the business owner. You, I know you've got, now that we're out of the pandemic, you'll be traveling a lot across to Asia, to Africa, sorry, and clients in different parts of the world. How do you keep yourself in a good shape in mentally, physically? Like what's your, have you got routines and plans that you, you used to mention meditation? Tell us a bit more about what you're up to so uh, so yeah so actually to be honest i i, I kind of let myself go after we started the business after my surgery because you know as i said you know wasn't my headspace wasn't the best i put on a lot of weight and feeling lethargic and so on and i don't know where it was and i just i just felt like you know i need to get you know i said i think it was um Bessels who said this he goes you know leaders are here to make decisions right and to make good decisions, you need to be in a good frame of mind. To be in a good frame of mind, you need to get the right rest. And physically, you need to be in good shape and, you know, do all of this kind of stuff. And I found that I was getting very foggy in my brain. And I think that's when I decided, I was like, look, you know, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get fit. I'm going to look after. I think there's there's a balance. You know, there's probably physical, mental, spiritual health that you need to look after. Your social interactions, your economic stuff. And then your purpose, you know, the, the kind of a few things that I think I started living my life by. And um, so the physical stuff was really important. So 2017, 2018, you know, uh, I think I shed about 16 kilos. Um, wow. A lot of yeah. weight. Yeah. So I started going to the gym. First time I went to the gym in my 40s. Um, so now I enjoy going to the gym. Uh, I try and go three, four times a week. It's been it's been off the charts over the last four weeks while I've been in South Africa. But um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to get back into it so I, I do that religiously and i and I, I go i used you know going out for a walk you know even a 20 minute walk is really good um sometimes my catch-ups with my team are whilst i'm walking yeah um, so that keeps you uh, active and then meditation is something that i i really kind of buy into because i think mental and spiritual kind of energy is really great and you know 10 minutes of meditation in the morning or in the evening i don't know um, i think it you know it just balances you. It centers you. It calms that you know that you know that mind we're talking about the, the pressure cooker. It does help. It doesn't help after one or two sessions. You've got to do it continuously for a period of time, and then you start to see the effects. And it it works at a very cellular level. So um, I, I think it it happens over time. Yeah, that's that is. I'll be honest. Something that I've picked up and I've got I've got Headspace on my phone. I've used it. Yeah. I've probably done hundred thousand hours with or no thousand minutes, maybe I don't know. It comes up every time I do it. Um, but I, last summer I did it every day and I started enjoying it and then I've fallen out. I've got to get back into that habit. Um yeah. I did like last night I went for a run at I think it was six o'clock. I just I had a gap and then I was I had a two hour meeting with my business partner, seven till yeah. nine. 
and I went for a 7K run and I felt, you know, I wouldn't normally do that at night. If I'd not done it by the morning or the afternoon, I was done. But I was like, you know what, I'm going out. And I felt, I looked like a Wally. I had my new, uh, my new Illuminous jacket on so I didn't get run over in the dark. Um, but Better to be felt, safe. It felt so amazing when I got back. I was like, you know what? Yeah. And you, you're 100% right. Like, your, your alcohol consumption, your food consumption, yeah. the amount you burn, you burn the candle at that end so much that you, you will struggle to, to remain present in in the moment and and that's that's probably what i'm i struggle with the most is staying present and not trying to do too many things and just keep focusing on one thing at a time i think because we could be responding to messages all the time to different people clients candidates internals it's tricky um final question for you where do you see where's your future like you talked about like the journey and enjoying it and you know i know i've met brad and i can see i can see that you guys are on a mission what does that look like paint the kind of future vision for you, for the business for us okay so look we're really we're highly passionate about talent acquisition we're highly passionate about africa you know i think africa has got phenomenal talent south africa has got phenomenal talent kenya the whole of africa is you know it's just bursting we we want to be the number one embedded talent solutions business globally with us with an african heartbeat you know that that's kind of our um, our mission, you know, our purpose as business is to empower others through or empower, you know, change their lives through work. So it's about creating new jobs. You know, one of the things that I want to do is create so many jobs in Africa or in, in other countries where we're taking people out of, you know, kind of impoverished backgrounds and kind of bringing them through, giving them that platform and opportunity. And it's opening up the world to the, the talent, um, uh, you know, globally with the technology that we have. I think the pandemic has accelerated a lot of this. Mm -hmm. um, so we definitely see ourselves, you know, wanting to become the number one uh, player in this space. And it doesn't, it's not the number one necessarily by size and scale, but it's by, you know, quality or being known for that. And, you know, definitely get the talent out there and, and you know, keep that African heartbeat. I love that. And, and do you see yourself retiring and, and being like your uncle and, and, and or do you see yourself just, keeping hold of the business and working as long as you can so you know i think in an ideal world if if, if i could uh, write this script um, which we're hoping to do you know we would uh, we would grow the business to a great size bring our future manage future leaders through i always say you know I'd, I'd love everyone in our business to take a step forward you know and i think if that they take a step forward it forces the organization to move forward and move your skill set you know, I don't want to be the CEO who's sitting here perpetually. You know, if there's someone better here to take the job, then please take it. Um, it'll either force me to, you know, improve myself or go do something else. You know, I'm, I'm still a, a shareholder in the business and, um, you know, someone can take it to another level, then great. Um, so if I could write the script, it would be taking the business to a great size, having future leaders run the business. And, you know, I, I probably would want to go and, you know, if, if we if we do are fortunate enough to, to make some cash off this is to go run some passion projects, you know, and a couple of those are making impactful stuff going on in Africa. We're supporting some girls charities there. And another passion project is, you know, kind of going and buying a boutique little hotel, you know, by the, by the sea and, and running that for family and friends. So, you know, wow. where would that be? So ideally in, in, in Africa again, so we're probably, you know, the ideal would be to have a little game lodge, um, a little, uh, spot on a, on a vineyard and and one by the beach so have a have kind of a trifecta of uh, three wow. just like really cool um you know boutique type places sounds amazing yeah love that uh, well look i'm confident you can achieve it for sure um thank you so much today ishbal it's been a pleasure i hope you've enjoyed it and and i hope everyone listening has enjoyed it if anyone does want to reach out to you if anyone's like you know i'd love to pick your brains ask you any questions are you open to that if they just dm you on linkedin or whatever absolutely please dm me and you know if there's any advice i can give any support help you know would love to if anyone wants to find out more about africa the talent in africa you know anything like that please you know by all means reach out to me legend thank you so much mate um i'm sure you'll be tagged in everything that we do and uh i'm confident that you know moving forward people will reach out i'm gonna make an effort to get you back on the show in the future and we'll find out just how you get on with achieving this vision all right Sean, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Legend. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make 
this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode is brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media, and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2,000 recruiters right now, both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week. That's live on LinkedIn at 12 p.m. on Thursday, or you can catch the show on the following Monday from 6 a.m. on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'll see you soon.